The last five months of peace. We often suffer the problem of looking at history with 2020 hindsight, dissecting decisions and actions made with our modern knowledge of the past. With hindsight, we know more should have been done to stop Hitler before the war, that Neville Chamberlain didn't do enough. Yet at the same time, no one knew how far Hitler would go, nor the terror he would unleash on Europe. Chamberlain has been treated harshly for his actions, with the worst calling him a coward. He dealt with Hitler honestly and openly, and thought he was receiving the same in return, which we know was not the case. He wanted to prevent a war which would kill the nations of Europe's young men. In the end, he did fail, but it wasn't because he didn't try to prevent it. The causes for the Second World War have often been, for the most part, simplified, and to a lesser degree ignored. In some ways, they began the moment the Great War ended. And while a great deal of responsibility must land with Adolf Hitler and his aggressive expansionistic ideals, there were, however, a great many countries and people involved in what would become the eventual conflict, a conflict that was ruled more often by politics and in some ways did not end until 1989. April. There were in reality two serious problems with Europe. One was obviously Germany. The harsh reality of the Treaty of Versailles had left the German people bitter. Hitler had given the German people something to believe in as well as to follow. At that time, he seemed Germany's saviour and not the madman he turned out to be. The other major problem was Soviet Russia. The communist state was not very respected, and they were met with a mixture of fear as well as suspicion. They remained a great problem for many years, and some felt at the time that they were a greater enemy than Germany. The tensions had been slowly building for several years, since the end of the Great War, and the Western powers had been debating on how to handle Germany. None of them had a clear idea of what to do, only that something needed to be done. In the last five months of peace, events began to move at a staggering pace. The British stated defence of Polish sovereignty was well-meaning and made for the right reasons. It was not viewed that way from Soviet Russia. The Soviets were a young government, politically at odds with all the capitalist powers, and mistrustful of what they saw as imperialistic countries trying to interfere in Eastern Europe. They resented that they were not consulted or being considered on equal footing with countries like England and France. The Soviets tried to engage the Baltic states in dialogue, but the action did not last long. By its end, the Soviets had proposed an alliance with Britain and France. They had worked out something that the British had known for a while, but had said little on the subject. The simple fact was that Britain's guarantee of Poland was symbolic only when it was made. Without the aid of the Soviets, there was very little the English could do to protect Poland. They were not located near them geographically, nor in 1939 were they armed to the extent to take on Germany head-on. They were relying on the old system of alliances to build a strong force that could handle Germany. The Soviets had a big concern regarding Japan. In preceding years, they had fought a war with them and lost. This was not forgotten by the Soviets. With Germany in negotiation with the Japanese, it created a very real sense of unease in Moscow. The Soviets felt that it would be difficult to deal with the Japanese and instead made diplomatic feelers to Germany. They were quietly making it known that they wanted a better relationship with the Germans. In Italy, Mussolini was struggling with Hitler's growing power. Mussolini was a vain man who very much enjoyed the position he was in on a world stage. He was reasonably respected by the British and was seen as a possible moderator that could be used to help control Hitler. Mussolini knew that Italy was not in as strongest position as she often portrayed. The relationship between Mussolini and Hitler is one that is still not fully understood to this day. There is on some level respect and mutual friendship. Mussolini wanted to be Hitler's equal and to be able to stand with him. In an effort to show Italy's power, he invaded Albania on April 7, 1939. This action had far-reaching implications. The British who were trying to solve the German issue without armed conflict now found themselves with an Italian problem. The Albanians were in no position to stop Italy, and the conflict was over in a matter of weeks. In response, the British extended their guarantee of defence to Turkey, Greece, and hoping to catch Romania as well as Bulgaria to form an alliance. One problem the English were having was that most of the Allies all had different agendas. France wanted to change its agreement with the Soviets. This agreement was originally made in 1935. They wanted a firmer guarantee from the Soviets that they would aid the French if the Germans invaded. It was becoming a very tangled web. The British felt that speed was needed, and more so they drew a very strong distinction between their action and those of their allies. In the eyes of the British, the defence guarantees they were making were aimed as non-threatening deterrence, a situation they hoped would make Hitler think twice, while not actually threatening Germany directly. They saw France's strengthening of military alliances which were more strongly worded and directly aimed at Germany as a provocation. France had made no effort to hide the fact that they saw Germany as an enemy. 
The British felt that Germany had to some degree a right to feel bitter about the sanctions placed on her after the Great War, and through diplomacy the situation could be managed. There were concerns in England and France that they were offering a far stronger guarantee than the Soviets were in regards to mutual defence. The Soviets were very concerned about British involvement in Turkey, so much so in fact that they sent their deputy foreign minister on a visit to the Balkans to try and ascertain the British's true intention. In the meantime, Litvinov's 10-year Anglo-Franco-Soviet pact was rejected. The British still hoped to have Hitler at the diplomacy table rather than preparing to rebel borders. There were also a great deal of animosity from the Poles towards Soviet Russia. The British were concerned that a pact might antagonize the Poles and the Romanians. They felt that a stronger Balkan alliance and an assurance from the Soviets they would offer aid if it was required and without a strong formalized agreement between the big three powers would be a strong enough deterrent to stop Hitler if he was considering an armed conflict. The British were still sure that speed was needed and it would have taken quite some time to negotiate an agreement that was to be accepted by England, France, Russia but also Poland and Romania. May. The British were underestimating the Soviets. It may have been a simple case of the two nations looking at things differently, but the Western powers wanting to keep the Soviets out of European affairs was true. When they refused the Tri-Nation Pact, but moved ahead with the Balkan alliances, which the Soviets felt was in their backyard, it must have seemed at best not fair play, and at worst an effort to keep them confined. It was not lost on them, however, that they were being kept out of the serious negotiations, yet being kept as a last resort if war did come. This was a situation that was unacceptable for the communist government. May was a month of decisive action, even if they were not always recognized at the time. The Soviet foreign minister, Litvinov, was replaced. He was a shrewd man and one who was a tough negotiator, but he had been a man of his word and had genuinely sought closer cooperation with the West. His replacement, Molotov, was a much harsher individual and was closely tied to Stalin. Hitler had tried to get some of the Balkan countries to sign non-aggression pacts. This was partly to try and stop the Soviets from gaining a foothold, but also to block the British attempts in the region. Germany did sign pacts with Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania. The German attempts with Turkey and Romania failed, and they remained signed with the British. One failure Germany was having was in regards to Japan. The negotiations were tense, though not hostile, and while Japan has always been considered part of the Axis powers due to her eventual signing with Germany and Italy, it is also true that the Japanese never moved with Germany and the two nations acted completely independent of one another. The British, whom had been moving forward with their peaceful attempts to end the conflict before it had begun, now made a calculated move. It had been made with the intention of a contingency in mind, but the Germans saw it differently. England introduced conscription on April 26th. The Germans saw this as the British preparing for war. Hitler used this action as a reason to move forward. He revoked the German-Polish non-aggression pact, and perhaps more importantly, he also denounced the 1935 naval treaty, which limited size and weights of navies. While this act was in and of itself very important for Germany, it was also largely symbolic, as she was already breaking the treaty. They would produce several large warships that were outside the treaty. Some of these were the Graf's Bay, Tirpitz, and the infamous Bismarck. Although Britain was starting to prepare for war, Hitler was still sure that they meant to avoid it. France was still a political mess, and while the French army was of concern, he was more worried about the Soviets. He did not want a war on two fronts, and he needed to find a way to keep the war with the Soviets delayed as they needed to prepare. The way around this problem was to many so outlandish that it was doomed to fail. But the idea persisted, and the possibility of some form of pact with the Soviets began to take hold in German diplomatic circles. This would not be an easy thing to accomplish, and indeed Schulenberg's first meeting with Molotov to begin to test the waters by suggesting economic ties went so badly that the German diplomatic corps had serious doubts. On May 23rd, Hitler met with his generals and possibly for the first time made true what his intentions were going to be. Diplomacy would, from this point on, be nothing but rhetoric. The way forward was Poland, and it would be through war. At this point, the details were still in their infancy. An overall idea had been formed and the meeting focused a great deal on what action would be taken if Britain and France intervened. Hitler felt that a swift hard attack at France and Belgium would be needed in that eventuality. Britain could do little if France was out of the war. Germany began now to seriously plan for war. The British were still trying to fix the situation diplomatically. They were working on a plan that they thought might be able to appease the Soviets and those Balkan countries whom had animosity towards Russia. The Soviets still saw it as giving everything to Britain for little in return. Even in Britain, it was not clear-cut. For some, the thought of dealing with the Soviets was like selling one's soul to the devil, and their dissenters were firmly fixed on dealing with Hitler. In the end, both the Nazis and the Soviets needed to be stopped, as the Nazis clearly showed, and then decades of a Cold War, which had begun almost before the Second World War had ended. 
Molotov was firm in his demands and the British were not willing to fully meet them. This led to an interesting situation. The Soviets knew Germany wanted to ultimately attack them. The Germans had full understanding that the Soviets expected an attack. Neither country was ready for war with the other and they both needed time to repair. June The negotiation between Russia and Britain was feverish during June and it dominated all other things. There were counter-proposals and articles from prominent Soviet officials being published in Pravda, the official Soviet newspaper on the situation. The Soviets wanted formal guarantees included in the treaty which covered Belgium, Latvia, Finland and Estonia. These countries were very vocal about not wanting any guarantee from the Soviets. The debates in Britain over the proposal were causing them a great deal of indecision. After much discussion, they decided that what the Soviets were really after was permission in writing from the international community to move into any of the listed countries if attacked. The British thought this was not for their sake, but rather the Soviets, and a big question raised was would the Soviets pull out of these countries once the crisis was over? Many did not think so. July. The time for peace was coming to an end. The focus was turning to Poland. The plans for invasion continued as the tension was raised in the press. The propaganda wasn't just for Western eyes even though there was a chance that if the Poles looked to be the aggressors, that the support may not be as forthcoming. Hitler also needed the support at home. The act of war was going to be a gigantic step, especially considering how Germany had suffered at the end of the last one. Their fear would be high, and it was vital to have public opinion on his side. One of the flashpoints was Danzig. The city was meant to be a free city. This was proving to be very difficult, as both the Poles and the Germans in the city were aggressive towards the other. Political entanglements were constant, with one of the biggest involving the number of Polish custom officials in the city. The number had been increased, and the Germans protested. The Poles responded angrily and threatened an increase to the officials' numbers again. Back in May, a Danzig citizen had been shot at a protest by a Pole. The protester was a member of the Danzig SA, but this didn't stop the German propaganda machine from using the incident to their advantage. The British had been taking a stronger position with Germany, but here they weakened. They decided to approach Goering with a proposal. The proposal itself was not England's crowning achievement. It dealt largely with an offer to expand markets in Africa for English and German benefits. It harked back to the old days of imperialism, and the proposal was leaked, which led to heated attacks in the press not only in Germany and Italy, but also in England. The Germans were nearing readiness for the invasion of Poland and Italy was sure that war was still not imminent, certainly not in 1939. Japan was still proving to be difficult, and they had not yet officially signed the agreement with Germany. Japan was also becoming more tied in China, and the US was now starting to become more involved in the region. A lot rested on the Soviets. Hitler believed that if there would be no solid pact between the Allies and the Soviets, that the Allies would do little to aid Poland. August. The German option of a non-aggression pact with the Soviets was starting to come to fruition. In August, they responded favorably to a discussion about Poland. The Soviets had no love for the Poles. Hitler felt more confident now and started to apply more pressure in Danzig. Here, the two countries battled it out through diplomacy, though in truth, Germany was using it only with the goal to legitimize the invasion which was to come. The Poles had decided that concessions and appeasement only led to situations like in Austria and Czechoslovakia, and they adopted a strong stance. It was unsophisticated and direct. The Poles would not stand for any aggression in Danzig and would respond appropriately. They were also sure that they could defeat Germany if military action came to pass. Hitler never received the true fruits of his plan, and the world never really saw the Poles as the aggressor that the Germans were merely defending themselves against, but it did play an important role. While the Danzig situation played out, it brought the Germans the time they needed to prepare. The Italians who were working on a timetable of war starting in 1942 suddenly came to the realization that 1942 was not the plan that Herr Hitler was working on. The Italian Foreign Minister Siano met with Hitler. The meeting did not go well and Siano knew that while they were allies, it was now obvious that Germany now felt strong enough to ignore Italy's recommendations. While Molotov was negotiating with Germany, they were also doing so with the West. This had been debated as to why, but one possible reason was to see which side would ultimately offer the best prospects. In the end, it was Germany who made the very clear details, and Molotov offered a non-aggression pact. This would be signed on the 23rd of August. September In the early hours of the 1st of September 1939, the German army crossed the Polish frontier. The Poles, who had been so defiant, were now totally unprepared for the onslaught that was unleashed. A truly modern battle plan was being used for the first time. Blitzkrieg was now here. Although the German invasion of Poland was in the grander sense the reason Britain went to war, and to enforce her guarantee of Polish sovereignty, it was in fact one last chance at peace, and with its refusal that ended in the declaration of war. An ultimatum was sent, 
It stated plainly that hostilities must end and German troops must withdraw to their territory by the 3rd of September. This did not happen and both parties were committed to a course of action. War was declared. This morning the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that, unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received, and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. You can imagine what a bitter blow it is to me that all my long struggle to win peace has failed. Yet I cannot believe that there is anything more or anything different that I could have done and that would have been more successful. Up to the very last, it would have been quite possible to have arranged a peaceful and honourable settlement between Germany and Poland, but Hitler would not have it. He had evidently made up his mind to attack Poland whatever happened, and although he now says he put forward reasonable proposals which were rejected by the Poles, that is not a true statement. The proposals were never shown to the Poles, nor to us, and although they were announced in a German broadcast on Thursday night, Hitler did not wait to hear comments on them, but ordered his troops to cross the Polish frontier. His actions show convincingly that there is no chance of expecting that this man will ever give up his practice of using force to gain his will. He can only be stopped by force. We and France are today in fulfilment of our obligations, going to the aid of Poland, who is so bravely resisting this wicked and unprovoked attack on her people. We have a clear conscience. We have done all that any country could do to establish peace. The situation in which no word given by Germany's ruler could be trusted, and no people or country could feel themselves safe, has become intolerable. And now that we have resolved to finish it, I know that you will all play your part with calmness and courage. At such a moment as this, the assurances of support that we have received from the Empire are a source of profound encouragement to us. The government have made plans under which it will be possible to carry on the work of the nation in the days of stress and strain that may be ahead. But these plans need your help. You may be taking your part in the fighting services, or as a volunteer in one of the branches of civil defence. If so, you will report for duty in accordance with the instructions you have received. You may be engaged in the work essential to the prosecution of war for the maintenance of the life of the people, in factories, in transport, in public utility concerns, or in the supply of other necessities of life. If so, it is of vital importance that you should carry on with your jobs. Now may God bless you all. May he defend the right. It is the evil things that we shall be fighting against. Brute force, bad faith, injustice, oppression, and persecution. And against them I am certain that the right will prevail. Neville Chamberlain's speech to the nation when war was declared. In truth, it was not just Germany that invaded Poland. Soviet Russia also invaded, and Poland was split in two. A situation that was largely ignored both at the time and since. When victory in Europe finally came and the West celebrated success over the Nazis, Poland still found herself occupied. Nazi Germany had to be stopped, and stopped they were. The goal during the war had changed from Polish sovereignty to the destruction of Nazi Germany. Poland, however, would swap one dictator for another and remain so until the communist empire would fall in 1989. Europe as a whole was saved, but in regards to the Poles, we failed them badly.